everyone. Uh, welcome to our teaching entitled The Border Wall as a Policy Option and Political Symbol. Um, I just want to take a moment to remind everyone about our values of inclusion. Um, and so throughout our discourse today, please keep things civil. Um, if you feel that you can, you remove yourself so that we don't have to remove you. Um, that's it. With that, I will. Do you want, do you want this mic or that? Hi, my name is Doug Massey. I'm a professor here in sociology in the Woodrow Wilson School. I've been studying migration between Mexico and the United States since 1978. I started uh, just after I'd finished my PhD here at Princeton, working as a postdoc. I ran into somebody who had spent a year living in a town in the state of Michoacan in Mexico where three quarters of the families had somebody migrating to the United States and sending money back. From then, uh, I started, and in 1982 launched a project uh, now known as the Mexican Migration Project that has been gathering data, data continuously year by year since 1987 and has built up the largest source of data, I think accurate and reliable data, undocumented and undocumented migration between Mexico and the United States. Uh, in 1999, with my colleague Jorge Durand at the University of Guadalajara, I launched another project known as the Latin American Migration Project, which undertook surveys in different countries around Latin America using the methods that we developed originally in Mexico, which is a combination of ethnographic and survey research to compile accurate and reliable data by gathering data on the migration patterns uh, of everyone in, in every household we surveyed and a complete migration history for all household heads of households that we surveyed. <clears throat> and um, most of my research uh, is based on the data we've assembled, which is all publicly available for download. Just type Mexican Migration Project or Latin American Migration Project into Google and you will find the data. So if what I say today makes you think that I'm making stuff up and these are alternate facts, feel, feel free to download the data and check it out for yourself. As you probably are all aware, we have an undocumented population of 11 million people in the United States today. This is the largest number of people living in the United States without any social, economic, civil, political rights since the days of slavery, when there were only about four million slaves in the United States in 1860 on the verge of the Civil War, we now have 11 million people with no legal rights at all. <clears throat> I want to tell you how we got into this circumstance. How did we end up with a population of 11 million people living without authorization in the United States? And it's a story that most people don't really understand, and the large size of the undocumented population is largely of our own making as a result of our own immigration and border policies. Mexican migration to the United States is not new, of course. It goes back to the turn of the century. In 1907, uh, the United States reached an agreement with Japan, known as the Gentleman's Agreement. The agreement was the United States would not ban Japanese immigrants from coming to the United States, in return for which Japan would not let their people come to the United States. So they wouldn't have to suffer the in in indignity that had happened to Chinese of being banned. In 1907, this created immediately labor shortages all over the Southwest. The Japanese had been uh, uh, the backbone of the uh, agricultural workforce. And labor recruitment in Mexico began. And this is really the start of mass migration between Mexico and the United States. Initially, recruitment under private auspices. Uh, the railroads in Mexico in 1907 had been financed by American uh, investors and were American-owned, and so recruiters simply rode the rail lines down from uh, the United States. The lines would go north-south to export uh, Mexico's uh, raw materials to the United States, so they just followed the rail lines down until they ran into large populations in the western states of Mexico, around Jalisco, Guadal um, 
Michoacan, Guanajuato, Zacatecas, and San Luis Potosí are the five biggest. And that's where labor recruitment really began. The border was pretty much deserted at that point. Tijuana was about 500 people. Um, so that's where they began labor recruitment. Uh, when uh, World War I broke out, the government set up an uh, assistance program to help the labor recruiting. Uh, and uh, once the United States got into the war in 1914, uh, uh, the uh, migration from Mexico to the United States surged. And in 1920 and 1924, the U.S. Congress passed restrictive quota laws intended to stop migration from Southern and Eastern European, Europe. Basically, read Jews and Catholics from entering the United States. Um, but the laws, the quota laws never applied in the Western Hemisphere. And when the flows from uh, Southern and Eastern Europe were cut off first by the outbreak of the First World War, and then by the, in the 1920s quotas, uh, Mexican migration surged. Mexico in the 1920s was recovering from a devastating revolution and civil war, and there was plenty of uh, uh, labor to be had to migrate to the United States, and the U.S. economy in the 1920s was booming, the Roaring Twenties. And in the absence of Southern and Eastern European migrants, Mexicans uh, uh, came in. Uh, historians call it the flood tide of Mexican migration to the United States. And it was all, almost all legal migration to the United States. The border was practically a non-entity, just a line on a map. The Border Patrol wasn't even founded until 1924, and it was founded not to keep Mexicans out, but to keep Southern and Eastern Europeans and Chinese from coming in through the southern border, because there's no restriction on Mexican immigration at that time. So uh, migration surged in the 1920s, and the size of the Mexican population doubled in the United States. When the U.S. annexed uh, the five states, southwestern states, in 1848, only about 50,000 people became suddenly overnight U.S. citizens. Uh, all the rest uh, of the people, Mexicans, uh, entered beginning in the early 20th century. And by uh, uh, 1929, it was about 800,000 people, uh, Mexican origin, living in the United States. Uh, mostly legal. Um, in 1929, of course, the stock market crashed, and the Great Depression began. And migrants that the United States had welcomed during the teens and 20s suddenly became unwelcome. And the United States launched a uh, mass deportation campaign from 1929 to 1935 that over the course of uh, the, uh, that period of time cut the size of the, uh, of the Mexican population basically in half with around 400 to 450,000 deportations. By 1935, the border was quiet. No one was crossing because there was no work in the United States. Then uh, in 1941, Pearl Harbor happened. And in 1942, the U.S. enters the Second World War draft with a mass draft, a mass mobilization that created labor shortages again in the United States. And U.S. officials went to Mexico and said, gee, we're real sorry about that deportation campaign 10 years ago. We could really use your workers now. And they reached an agreement with the Mexican government known as the Bracero Program. The Bracero Program began in 1942, originally as a temporary wartime measure. And from 1942 to 1945, really only tens of thousands of Mexican workers came into the United States. When the war ended in 1945, however, all those Okies had been flowing out of o Oklahoma into the valleys in California that you read about in the books by John Steinbeck. They all went into high-paying union jobs in uh, factories in California, in aerospace. And the post-war economic boom was just taking off. And suddenly agricultural employers could not find any workers. So basically they told their braceros, uh, which were still relatively few in number, that when you go back home at the end of the season, tell your uncles, aunts, cousins, brothers, to come on back with you and they'll find a job. And so undocumented migration begins. Um, in 19, and Congress uh, responds by slightly increasing the number of Bracero visas, but not sufficient to meet demand. And so undocumented migration can, can, continues to rise until 1953, 1954, when uh, the Eisenhower administration comes in to office, first Republican 
uh, administration since the beginning of the Great Depression. <clears throat> and um, Eisenhower appoints um, uh, the Marine Corps com former Marine Corps Commandant to be the head of the Immigration Service. And 1953-1954 is the end of the Korean War, so there was a recession in the United States. People were feeling briefly for a moment economically insecure. And it was also the height of the McCarthy era. And the border suddenly was portrayed as a dividing line from, that separated us from communist infiltration from the South. And uh, in 1953, 1954, the new administration under the Marine Corps Commandant and the Immigration Service launched something called Operation Wetback. The very first um, mass mobilized arrest series of arrests along the Mexico-U.S. border. <clears throat> and during 1953-1954, more than a million people were apprehended. And if you listen to uh, some of the alt-right people today, uh, they'll call for another Operation Wetback. That's what we need, another Operation Wetback, mass militarization of the border. Uh, because it was so successful in stopping immigration in 1953-1954. And if you look at the data, apprehensions along the border dropped from a million in 53 to 54 down to around 25,000. Basically, illegal migration stops. And uh, many people concluded it was because of the mass arrests, but that was not the reason. The reason was that Congress quietly, even as it authorized a mass militarization of the border, quietly increased the number of Bracero visas to 450,000 per year. And that was enough to satisfy agricultural demand at the time. And of course, at this time, there was no uh, uh, quota on Mexican immigration. And at the same time, 450,000 braceros were circulating back and forth on short-term work visas. Another 50,000 were entering the country with permanent resident visas. And surprisingly for many people, men, uh, a large fraction of the people who had these permanent re resident visas, green cards, were not actually living in the United States. They were just using it to free circulate freely on an annual basis for an established relationship with an employer in the United States. Um, uh, this went on uh, until 1965. In 1965, there were massive changes to the U.S. immigration system. And these changes were done not as immigration policy, but as civil rights policy for very good reasons, very noble cause, to eliminate racism in the American immigration system. It's, it sought explicitly to get rid of the national origins quotas and the outright bans on Asian and African and Middle Eastern migration to the United States, and get rid of the quotas that discriminated against Italians, uh, and Poles, and Russian Jews. And they did, they scrapped it. And they put in a new system, the one that we have today, where every country gets 20,000 visas per year, allocated according to family reunification criteria and labor needs. At the same time, however, they imposed for the first time quotas on the Western Hemisphere. Initially, in 1965, they imposed a, 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 a hemispheric quota of 120,000 visas per year for the entire hemisphere. Uh, and by 1976, they would phased in uh, the Western Hemisphere into a worldwide system where every country in the world gets 20,000 visas per country per year. In 1965, Congress also unilaterally terminated the Bracero program. And what happened was from late 70s to the late, from late 1950s to the late 1970s, we go from a well-established circulatory migration system of about 500,000 people coming in and out of the United States on an annual basis to a new system where the, the temporary work visas are gone and visas are limited for residents to 20,000 per country per year. So what happened to this well-established flow that had been building for 22 years of workers circulating back and forth between Mexico and the United States? Well, that began the current period of undocumented migration. The, the economic conditions on either side of the border hadn't changed. There were still jobs in the United States and workers in Mexico. Uh, uh, most of the jobs initially were in agriculture, food processing, and in, in, over time increasingly construction and services. Uh, and the, the flows simply reestablished themselves 
under undocumented auspices once the doors for legal entry were all but closed. So uh, from 1965 to 1979, basically the flow is reestablished. In 1979, the flow basically levels off and doesn't grow anymore. It just keeps fluctuating in tandem with economic cycles in Mexico and the United States. But the rapid growth of the flow of undocumented migrants stops around 1979-1980. And it pe peaks at like between 400 and 600,000 people circulating in and out every year. However, something had changed. What had changed was the status in which these people were migrating. They were migrating to the same jobs, the same states, with the same employers as they had before 1965, but now they were illegal migrants, and by a definition, therefore, criminals and lawbreakers. And this began a powerful new metaphor in the American media, known as the Latino threat narrative, where the border was seen as another uh, line of defense against a massive threat from the South. The metaphors that were used in the American press were initially uh, marine metaphors. Uh, Mexican migration was a flood that was going to drown American culture and inundate its society. But over time, and especially as the Cold War heated up during the Reagan administration, martial metaphors came to predominate. And you can see this uh, through analyses that have looked at the use of these metaphors in American media that grow rapidly from basically zero in 1965 to uh, in, tan in tandem with the rise in apprehensions after 65 to peak at around 1979 and 1980. And the martial metaphors were all about alien invaders who were launching bonsai charges and outgunned border patrol officers who were vainly trying to hold the line against this, this army of invaders who were going to occupy uh, the United States and, uh, and change its culture and society. And if you want to get a really good uh, feel for the zeitgeist that emerged in the 1980s, I urge you to rent Red Dawn, uh, a movie uh, that was very popular. I think it was Patrick Swayze's screen debut, uh, uh, where uh, the scene opens with um, paratroopers coming down on a small town in, in eastern Colorado, in the flat part of Colorado. Uh, they're Spanish-speaking soldiers uh, commanded by Russian officers and they're invading the United States to occupy it. And uh, the rest of the movie is about how the wrestling team beats a path out of town uh, by in a, in a pickup truck, stops at the guns and ammo store on the way out, and goes up into the foothills of the Rocky and launches a guerrilla warfare to retake their town back from the Ruskies and um, the, the Latinos. <clears throat> um, this was the zeitgeist. And in the middle of the zeitgeist uh, in 1986, Congress passes the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which gives the executive uh, the authority to declare immigration emergencies and militarize the border. Uh, it uh, launched uh, 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 what became a three-decade-long militarization of the Mexico-U.S. border to heights that were unheard of prior to this point. Uh, it, it criminalized undocumented hiring. Before that date, it was not illegal to hire somebody without documents. Afterwards, it was. And it authorized two legalization programs, one for farmers, uh, one for farm workers to get the um, growers on board and support the legislation, and another uh, amnesty for people who've been in the United States for five years continuously. And um, this actually um, uh, reduced the size of the undocumented population of the United States temporarily. Uh, between 1965 and 1985, the undocumented population had been growing slowly Despite the fact that most people were circulating back and forth, data that we've analyzed show that 85% of ent undocumented entries were offset by departures in any given year. So that the net inflow was really quite small, and the undocumented population rose over 20 years from zero in 1965 to about 3 million in 1985. Then there was a legalization program, and it drops back down to a million people. Uh, to, 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 sorry, two million people by 1988. But after 1986, the militarization of the border begins, slowly at first, but gathering steam in the early 1990s when the Border Patrol launched Operation Blockade in El Paso, and in 1994 when they launched, launched Operation Gatekeeper in, uh, in San Diego, the two busiest border crossings, which until that point in time, 
had accounted for between 75% of all undocumented crossings. Basically, it was a full-scale militarization, building of walls, literal walls, in these two border sectors, massive inputs of, uh, of uh, personnel and equipment, materiel, uh, and uh, essentially stop the flow in these two sectors. What's a poor migrant to do when they run into this wall of enforcement at, in San Diego and El Paso? Obvious thing, let's go around it. So the net effect of the policy was to divert the flows away from El Paso and Southern California into the Sonoran Desert across the border into Arizona. Prior to the mid-1990s, Arizona had been backwater along the border. There hadn't been significant Mexican immigration into Arizona since the 1920s. And then suddenly, hundreds of thousands of Mexicans were going through uh, the border, through the Sonoran Desert, into Arizona. And nothing had really changed except the locus of border crossing, but this fed the media hysteria about the alien invasion. A new invasion was going on. Because 30,000 uh, Mexicans arriving in Tijuana every week and crossing from Tijuana into San Diego don't draw much attention because that's a huge uh, metropolitan area of many millions of people, and it's heavily Mexican on the U.S. side and all Mexican on the Mexican side. And 30,000 Mexicans don't stand out. 30,000 Mexicans arriving in Douglas, Arizona, which is 25,000 people, make a bigger impression. And when they crossed across open ranch land that had been basically empty ranch land before that time, made a big impression. The press was, uh, was uh, attracted, and they covered the story as yet another a, a new invasion of, of the United States by illegal aliens. But in fact, the numbers hadn't changed. Uh, only the point of border crossing had changed. And it produced what turned out to be a permanent deviation of immigration away from uh, California. California, prior to the mid-1990s, was responsible for uh, about two-thirds of all Mexican settlement in the United States. If you look at the census data from 19, for 1985 to 1990, people who entered from 85 to 90, two-thirds went to California. Fast forward 95 to 2000, one-third go to California. 2000 to 2005, one-third. 2005 to 2010, one-third permanent deviation of migrants away from the state of California and pushing them out away from that state into the country during the economic boom of the 1990s. Unemployment reaches record low levels all over the country. And so what happened though is the migrants just flowed into new destinations. Prior to the mid-1990s, uh, 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 the vast majority of migrants went to three states. California, Texas, and Illinois. Or as my migrants say when I ask them, where did you go, what state did you move to? Uh, California, Texas, and Chicago. <laughs> Chicago is the second largest Mexican city in the United States after Los Angeles. And in huge neighborhoods, hundreds of thousands of people, Mexicans live there. Anyway, um, what this did was permanently reshape not only the geography of border crossing, but the geography of destinations in the United States, pushing migrants into new destination areas throughout the country. Uh, in, and the fastest growing Me Mexican populations were no longer in California, but were in places like North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Nebraska, Iowa. By pushing people away from relatively safe crossing sites in urban areas like Juarez, El Paso, Tijuana, San Diego, and out into high chaparral and open desert and rugged portions of the lower Rio Grande Valley, they made crossing a lot more expensive and a lot more dangerous. The death rate rose quite rapidly and dramatically along the border. To date, there's been well over 5,000 people killed in the process of border crossing. Uh, and it also um, drove up the cost. Prior to uh, the mid, or 1993, the average cost of a border crossing was about $600 in current dollars. And the services were relatively simple. You just cross from Tijuana to San Diego, you leave somebody at a 7-Eleven in Chula Vista, California, and they call their cousin in Los Angeles to come and get them. But 
now, after the border militarization, you're going through open desert. There's no populations on either side of the border. You need safe houses, you need equipment. And once you're across the border, you're miles from any big labor markets. So you need transportation and other safe houses. And it's much harder and riskier because the border is constantly being militarized. And so um, people began to minimize border crossing. The migrants minimized border crossing, not by staying in Mexico and not coming to the United States, but by staying in the United States once they'd paid the costs and experienced the risks, and they hunkered down and stayed. As they hunkered down and stayed, family members in Mexico began clamoring for reunification. And the longer they stayed, the more likely they were to bring in wives and start having kids in the US. Not as part of a strategy of anchor babies, but because they're 20-somethings and they're married, and they, that's what 20-somethings do. And then you start getting the buildup of a more permanent population. In essence, uh, between 1985 and about 2010, the uh, budget of the Border Patrol goes from about $200 million in constant dollars to about um, $3.6 billion. And the Border Patrol goes from about um, 2,000 officers to today's 21,000 officers. Uh, uh, and it is the largest arms-bearing branch of the U.S. government with the exception of the military itself. This militarization had profound consequences, but not the ones that people expected. Instead of decreasing illegal migration, it increased the net flow. Because if net migration equals in-migration minus out-migration, and you implement a massive policy that has little or no effect on in-migration, but dramatically reduces out-migration, net migration must increase. So in the 1990s, we were spending three to four billion dollars per year in order to double the rate of undocumented population growth. And from, recall that from 1965 to um, 1985, the population had only grown from zero to three million over the 20 year period. But from 1988 to 2008, the population goes from two to 12 million. And in 19, uh, 2008, the US recession hits, the Great Recession hits, and undocumented migration, undocumented migration actually stops. And the population falls from 12 million to 11 million, where it remains today. So in effect, our border policy took what had been a circular flow of male workers going to three states, doubled and turned it into a settled population of families living in 50 states, and doubled the, net, the rate of undocumented population growth. And we cannot go back to the status quo ante of circular migration with this population of people because now they've, got, they've been here for a long time. In point of fact, illegal migration is over. It ended nine years ago. There have been no net additions to the undocumented population since 2008. And if you look at the data, you find that illegal migration from Mexico began to slow down and fall starting around the year 2000 and was dropping rapidly when the recession hit and ended it definitively. And now the rate of uh, uh, undocumented migration of the United States is hovering around zero. Very few people are entering, very few people are going back. The ones who are going back are doing it under duress, at being deported or being threatened by deportation. And this is the status quo. So it's a wonderful time to build a border wall since mig illegal migration has been over for the last nine years. And the net flow is zero. The only flow at the border at this point is really Central Americans. And they were always there, uh, at least since our intervention in, in the 1980s. Prior to 1980, there was virtually no migration from Central America to the United States. We intervened in a big way, destroyed the economies of, of Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua, uh, massive uh, civil violence. We armed an army called the Contra Army, sent in the CIA to help death squads in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. The, the GDP of those four countries actually fell in absolute terms from 1980 to 1990, and millions of people were displaced. 
And um, Nicaraguans fleeing the Sandinista regime, a leftist regime, uh, were welcomed as refugees from communism. But all the people displaced by the violence and economic chaos that we unleashed in Central America, all the people from El Salvador, uh, from Honduras and Guatemala, could not be accepted as refugees because they were fleeing right-wing governments allied with the United States and therefore couldn't possibly be political refugees. And they entered <clears throat> mostly without documents. And um, they remain today, about 1.2 million of the 11 million people are Central Americans, and they're the only ones that are growing slightly. But that's offset by the negative outflow of Mexicans, so the population is relatively stable. And we're really talking about tens of, tens of thousands of people coming to the border, rather than, uh, than the hundreds of thousands that were coming to the border before. And they're basically refugees from a huge mess that we created in Central America that we walked away from after the peace accords were signed. Uh, and it could easily be handled with a reasonable refugee policy. There are not that many people. Nothing like the boat people after the collapse of Vietnam. But um, for political reasons, we have never been able to do that. So um, in, 19, in 2014, for the very first time in American history, there were more non-Mexicans apprehended along the border than Mexicans. And uh, in the latest data shows that apprehensions along the Mexico-U.S. border are at their lowest level since 1971. And in 1971, there were only 1,500 Border Patrol officers. Today, we have 21,000, and they can't, they can't even produce as many as they produced in 1971 with a much smaller labor force. So, uh, and uh, at this point, it's very clear that undocumented migration is over for Mexico and is waning even in Central America, largely because of the demographic transition. In, 1960, in the 1960s, the average Mexican woman had seven children. So the total rate was seven children per woman. By 2000, it had dropped to 2.3 children per woman. Today, it's around 2.2 children per woman, replacement level. Mexico has become an aging society. Labor force growth rates have plummeted. And the average age of people at risk of migrating has risen and risen and risen. Migration is highly age dependent. If you don't begin migrating between the ages of, say, 16 and 30, you don't start migrating after that, like crime, pretty much the same kind of age curve. And the average age in Mexico as a whole today is 28 years. And if you look at people above the age of, say, 16, the average age is like 43. So basically, Mexico's aged out of the migration sending ages. And so the boom is over, and it's not going to be coming back. And Central America, El Salvador is already below replacement. Honduras is near replacement. Guatemala is higher, but it's also falling. And those countries are small compared to Mexico. Salvador is like 5 million people. So basically, we're in a hemisphere where the threat of undocumented migration, the volume of undocumentation is low and is likely to stay low. So why, if border enforcement actually backfired in the past, and why, uh, if illegal migration is actually zero now, net zero, why all the attention to a border wall? And that's because the border is no longer just a line on a map, it's a political symbol. The border has become the line that political politicians draw on the, side, on the sand to say, we will defend at all costs to keep you protected. And that symbolic trope applies for any and all threats. You may have noticed that when Al-Qaeda came, uh, uh, surged and launched the terrorist attacks in 9-11, what did they call for? Closing the Mexico-US border. But of course, there's so many Muslim populations in Mexico. And if you're Al-Qaeda, where would you go to set up a, 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 a spy ring to launch an attack? Tijuana? Where the narcos will probably kill you? You stick out like a sore thumb because you don't drink. Uh, and when you're ready to launch your little attack on the United States, you face the most militarized border anywhere except the Korean DMZ. Or would you go to Toronto? Large Muslim population to blend into open border, and in Canada there are well-known terrorist cells. One was convicted in the Millennium Plot, trying to bomb the LA uh, X airport in, in, in the Millennium. But all the attention is focused on 
the Mexican border because it's brown people and it's inherently threatening. It's a threat from the South. So when Ebola hit, our leaders, uh, alt-right leaders and Republican congressmen and senators called for closing the Mexico-U.S. border because there's lots of West Africans dying to get in from, um, from uh, Mexico to the United States. And there's so many plane flights from West Africa to um, Mexico. And um, ISIS, now their the fear is ISIS, so we need to, whenever fear of ISIS comes up, we want to they call for closing the border. So the border is now a political symbol, uh, a line of defense against any and all threats from the United States, and the threats are cultural, uh, terrorists, uh, 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 and uh, frankly, very racialized. And so, um, the, the purpose of calling for the border wall, the reason Donald Trump signs a border wall, on, uh, an executive order calling for a border wall on day one, is it's, it's a, a political symbol. It's payoff to appease his alt-right base. It says, basically, we are going to erect a wall. We're not going to let these brown people in. They are not Americans. They will not be accepted as Americans. They are unacceptable. They are polluting our country. Let's wall it off. Just as Ebola would be a disease polluting our country, people coming across are also polluting our country. It's a symbolic statement. And in, in the end, the wall doesn't even have to be built. He's already made the point by calling for it. And we'll see whether Americans are really willing to spend $23 billion to build a wall to solve a problem that doesn't exist. It will have no effect on undocumented migration because undocumented migration is zero. So it can't have an effect. But its purpose is not to have, it's not immigration policy. It's not about national security. It's symbolic politics about us and them. And uh, rejecting the other, the people outside the United States. It will have no practical effect in shaping migration to the United States. If anything, if it has any effect, it'll keep people from going back, which is what happened historically. So um, basically, we see, we see our country now gripped by a great deal of hysteria about an invasion that isn't happening, uh, uh, about uh, problems that don't exist. Uh, there's this tremendous fear of Sharia law in the United States now. Muslims are less than 1% of the U.S. population. And unlike Europe, the Muslims who migrate to the United States are mainly middle class and professionals, not working class. Uh, and they're integrated into American society, not segregated. Uh, but this fear, fear is a great political mobilizer. And it's the cultivation of fear of the other Muslims, Mexicans, Latin Americans in general, that is the reason for the wall and for the deportations that we're seeing today. So um, that's my analysis of the situation based on my 35 or so years of research studying Mexican immigration. And I've tried to tell our, our political leaders in Washington that militarizing the border was a big mistake, that it would actually increase the size of the undocumented population. I've testified before Congress five times, but they don't listen. They, and now that illegal migration has actually ended for the last nine years, they have a hard time letting go because it's such a useful mobilizer. They like illegal migrants and they want to demonize them. And now that they're gone, they are just turning to whatever uh, uh, symbols they have, build a wall, deport people. So um, I open the floor for discussion and questions. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. You can um, Google um, Border Wall, Adam Ruins Everything, a TV show called Adam Ruins Everything. I did a cameo appearance uh, uh, on this. It's, a, it's, a, it's gone viral on YouTube. It's all about the border wall and why it's stupid to build a border wall. And they, they did a really good production to explain in real clear terms why building a border wall is really dumb. Uh, and I did a cameo on that. Um, some, a couple of years ago, I wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times 
with um, the former foreign minister of Mexico. Um, and we said, look, uh, illegal migration stopped. Um, the, the, uh, we already quietly have put in, back in place a guest worker program. There are 350,000 Mexicans entering with temporary work visas every year, and 150 to 200,000 coming in with permanent resident visas. How do so many Mexicans come in with permanent resident visa if it's capped at 20,000? The caps don't apply to immediate relatives of U.S. citizens. And Congress in the mid-1990s scared the bejesus out of immigrants, and they began to naturalize in massive numbers. And they discovered that by naturalizing, they could bring in their, their, uh, uh, their uh, spouses and minor children and parents without numerical limitation. So uh, Congress, by beating on immigrants and punishing them, actually increased legal immigration. Um, Congress really doesn't understand what it's doing. It, when it makes policy, it's all about domestic politics and polit political symbolism. It's not about, oh, I understand what's happening with immigration and I want to affect, I want to affect immigration in some way. No, it's all political theater. Uh, so we published this and said basically, look, uh, out of the pillars of immigration reform, uh, a guest worker program is already there, uh, get control of the border, it's, migration's been zero for eight or nine years, uh, increase the quota for Mexico while the Mexicans have increased the quota themselves by naturalizing, the only thing left is a path to legalization for the 11 million people who are out of status. And we published that in the New York Times, and I got a call from the president of Mexico. And I was invited to a private meeting in Los Pinos, the Mexican White House, with President Calderon, to brief him on what was happening with Mexican immigration. Totally ignored by the Obama administration, totally ignored by Congress. Uh, and the Obama administration, upon coming into office, bought into the frame of the border as a threat. He immediately increased further the size of the Border Patrol, even though that year the population declined by a million people. And his own homeland. So, and this is not alternative facts. These are facts that are from Pew Research Center, which is a reputable center, from Homeland Security's own estimates, and from my estimates from the Mexican Migration Project. All show exactly the same thing. And he and he knows knows this coming into office. And then he ramps up deportations because he's bought into the frame that that these people are a threat. Uh, and once you buy into that framing, you're stuck. So, yeah, I've, I've written, I've been on TV, been on NPR, done academic minutes, done uh, all kinds of stuff. But um, it's very hard to get information out because there's so much deliberate misinformation and disinformation put into the public sphere to fill people's heads up with alternative facts. So if you talk to people, they think we're still being invaded by millions of Mexican immigrants per, per year. You talk to them, they think, that Muslims are like 30% of the U.S. population and already impose Sharia law. Uh, they live in a whole different world. And if that, that framework is in their head, my information comes in and just bounces right off. It doesn't stick. And they accuse me of being uh, an alternative fact, doing fake news. So I, got a, I get emails. I get a lot of hate, hate emails, as you might, uh, might imagine. One directed me to a website said, so you say there's no migration across the border. Well, look at this. And I go to a red site called Red Flag. <laughs> and they have a test of, uh, presumably the testimony of some Border Patrol officer on the border who says, the government's covering up the hundreds of thousands of people who are crossing. Uh, we're being overwhelmed. We need more manpower. Please get this word out. You know. And then you go to the Homeland Security website, and you get the actual numbers, and it's the lowest number of apprehensions in 1971. But that's what that person believes, and he thinks I'm making it up and I'm part of a liberal conspiracy to distort the facts. So your lecture goes uh, right in line with the sanctuary city uh, lecture. What's the status of this thing? I've been doing barrier cases for a hospital center, and I see a lot of them that are undocumented uh, people that have to go to the emergency room for medical care. Say someone is stabbed, and I see them this. Does that person have any legal recourse? Uh, like, say, if I were stabbed and I see No, no civil rights, no legal rights. He does have the right to emergency medical treatment. And that's it. That's all I see. In my and that's it. And as soon as, as soon as they can get you out of an ICU, they're gone. You're gone. Right. Um, so yeah, no, they don't have any legal rights. Um, 
uh, and it's interesting that um, uh, a violation of immigration law is a civil offense, not a criminal offense. It's a violation of civil law. They are. <laughs> it's, it's rising. Uh, against all foreigners, there was just a, a, some Sikh in um, Washington State that was shot dead because Joe Sixpack in Kent, Washington, I'm from, I was born and raised in Washington, so I can diss my own state. <laughs> some Joe Sixpack in, in, in Kent, Washington, sees a guy with a Sikh turban on, and he can't tell the difference between Arabs and Sikhs, so he shoots them um, because he thinks he's Muslim. I want to use actually the Sikh. Uh, and there's, uh, there's rising tide of violence, I think, against immigrants, but the immigrants don't report it because they're afraid and they don't want to go to the police. And this is one of the reasons the police oppose cracking down on the immigrants and the deportations because it makes it very difficult to police uh, and it lets criminals get away with many things. Oh, we're almost done. Okay, um, one more question. You had your hand up first, so... Um, uh, right now, that's the main source of any entry, uh, mainly visa overstays. Uh, but it's small numbers compared with the number of border crossers that we observed before. If you look at the estimates of the size of the undocumented population by Homeland Security or by Pew uh, Research Center, uh, less than 2% of all undocumented migrants are from China and less than 2% are from India. Uh, and those are base populations over a billion. So it's t t really relatively small number. 60% are from Mexico, another 15 to 20% are from Central America. So basically 75 to 80% of all migrants come from the, the Central America or Mexico, and, the re and a big chunk come from South, another chunk come from South America. Very few come from the rest of the world. It's basically a Western Hemisphere problem. Thank you. <laughs>